My name is Rhonda Brown, and this is how I create. Welcome to This Is How We Create, a show that digs deeper into the creative life of contemporary artists of color. Discover what feeds their creativity and how they found or are finding their artistic voice. Through these intimate and candid conversations, you'll gain insights into the lives of creative professionals of color that are hard to find anywhere else. Hi, it's Martine Severin here. I'm so happy you've turned into my conversation with Rhonda K. Brown. We dig deep in Rhonda's background from her as a little girl learning from the great black artists in the last 40 years to hear her journey as an artist herself. Her path to her career as a fine painter hasn't been a straight one, but if you've learned anything from our past guests, from Nolis Anderson, who started out as a pharmacist and is now a photographer, and to Danielle Truthin-Theranon, who transitioned to ceramics, no one's path is linear. Lastly, if you enjoy our podcast and if you've enjoyed our past episodes, please leave us a review on iTunes. The reviews really help other wonderful people like you find the podcast. Now, let's get started. My name is Martine Severin, and this is how we create. We're chatting with Rhonda Brown, a native Clevelander on the podcast today. Rhonda hails from a family that opened the first for-profit African-American gallery in the country, the Malcolm Brown Gallery in Shaker Heights, Ohio, in 1980. At a young age, Rhonda had the opportunity to meet and spend time with the artists the gallery represented, including Romaria Bearden, Elizabeth Catlett, Huey Lee Smith, Selma Burke, Carolyn Maslumi, and many others. Growing up with art all around her inspired Rhonda to complete a Bachelor of Fine Arts with a double major in painting and drawing and art history from Ohio State University. Thereafter, she interned at the Cleveland Museum of Art during its 75th anniversary and then completed her master's degree in art history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Brown's expressive, colorful paintings confront the viewer Her abstracted human form, palette, expressive lines, communicate solemnity and boldness equally. Brown's work appears in private collections throughout the country and has been featured in Samela Lewis's International Review of African American Art, Oprah at Home magazine exhibitions, and Architectural Interiors. Her new venture is a company she started with her son, Avery Saffold, called Critique House. Welcome to the show, Rhonda. Hi there. How are you? I'm so happy to talk with you. I discovered your work quite by accident, Rhonda, because I was visiting a friend and I got to see one of your paintings up front and I was just bowled over. I think I wanted to take out my checkbook, so to speak, right then and there. (laughs) That's so nice to hear. Thank you. Your parents opened their gallery, the Malcolm Brown Gallery in Shaker Heights in the 80s. Can you tell me what are some of your memories of the gallery? My mother was a distributive education teacher, which that's what business education was called. And my dad was an art teacher. They decided in 1980 that my mom would stop working And they would open up the gallery because for years we had been driving across the country with my father, who was one of the first black member of the American Watercolor Society. As a member of AWS, I think your role is to both paint, write, and show. They have all these interesting criteria that the artists have to follow. They cannot use the color black or white in their paintings. My dad was very active in creating work, submitting pieces for competitions, uh, showing all over the country. They drove literally from Virginia Beach to California with us to participate in all these types of things. Um, And then they decided in 1980, after driving across country to um, open up the gallery in the middle of the country in Shaker Heights, Ohio. During that time, Black artists primarily were represented in two types of galleries, majority galleries owned by white owners that were for-profit or black galleries that were not for-profit. Those were 
by coastal either on in New York or in California. And so my mom and dad decided that they were going to open up a gallery right in the middle of the country and introduce the region to the brilliance of African American artists. Wow, that's amazing. Do you remember the conversations that they must have had while they were trying to make a the decision to open the gallery or is this something that they always wanted to do? I really don't recall. I mean, I was so young, right? I was very young. I, like I'm I'm 50 now, so 1980 I was I don't know. <laughs> you do the math. <laughs> I was a little girl. But you know, the things that I remember most are, you know, helping my mom pull together the invitations for the exhibitions that she would have. I remember doing a lot of the accounting with her. They had postcards, they had prints, they had original works, you know, and so as the gallery grew and as she you know, and, and quite, to be honest, I have no clue how my mother made the relationships that she did and retained them. But because of who I am as an artist and a relationship developer and builder, I, I believe I've got, you know, her genealogy, you know, <laughs> I remember, for example, meeting and spending a lot of time with Elizabeth Catlett when I was little, well, meeting and spending a lot of time with Huey Lee Smith and Romare Bearden and, Carolyn May Salumi, and then just seeing like a banister piece. Um, they had a tanner at one point that they purchased. My mother worked a lot with June Kelly, who is a very well known and respected black art dealer, part of the American Dealers Association. I think she might have been the first. And she and my mom forged this really strong relationship a long time ago. And that's how they built this unbelievable collection of artists that came to Cleveland, Ohio, partnered with the museum, the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is one of the most extraordinary institutions in the country, brought, as I said, the brilliance of African-American artists to the region a very long time ago. Ah, oh, it sounds magical, but it also sounds like a lot of hard work, but magical and such an important task something to do because I, I feel as if they were building the foundation of what we now have. I do think that we're going through this or it seems like we're we're in this renaissance where more black fine artists are are coming out and they're creating and they're actually getting their work sold and they're gaining attention um, and they're exhibiting in galleries. I think that's in part due to what your parents did. Yeah. You know, my parents are in their 80s now and struggling certainly with health issues. And I've been kind of going through a lot of their things and their boxes and, you know, just finding things like here's an original print of, by Jacob Lawrence. And this is like a certificate of authenticity. All the conversations she had with these like really cool people in the 80s, right? And the 90s. I just didn't really realize how extraordinary my parents were and are, of course, you know, like as a kid, you look at your parents and like, Oh, I'm like, that's my mom. You know what I mean? But like, literally, as you said, you know, she really had a vision. And when I say she, it's my dad is an extraordinary artist, right? He really focused on creating, but my mother was the one who just like put this vision together and just worked really hard. You know, she would wake up every morning and she'd be at the gallery doing, calling, you know, planning exhibitions and, you know, working with customers. And back then, of course, your customers buying a piece of, work, of art that was $3,000 in the 80s, late 80s, that was a lot of money. You know, she'd have people with payment plans and I've got all these really like great, you know, records of all this stuff that, kind of the historical accounting of, of how she did her business. It's pretty cool. And also, you know, I hear stories all the time from her friends and customers, you know, about the work that they have or how they met, you know, and spent time or had dinner with Elizabeth Catlett, you know, at their mm -hmm. house. And then to see what's translated now into nearly every auction American art auction is led by one of the great traditional African-American artists or even many of the new wonderful artists that have been born out of this movement. It's, it's really gratifying to see that and to be a part of it myself as an artist, even though I am not <laughs> at that level where my work is being auctioned off, but I certainly aspire to that. 
I recently discovered the work of Elizabeth Catlett. I attended a portfolio review in New York a few years ago, and for some reason or another, it was really raining, and I had this huge pink umbrella, and I just didn't. I wanted a break from the rain, and there was an art show, a print show that was going on. So I cross the street and I fold my pink umbrella and I put it down and I walk in and I'm meandering and meandering. And then I come across this print by Elizabeth Catlett and I had not known her or her work before. And since I've done, I've dug, I've really done a lot of research on her and it's, I'm wowed by what she was able to do and about her history and you know how she grew up and you know she taught in New Orleans and then she moved to Mexico and her work is just so amazing and to think that you met her how awesome is that yeah she is an extraordinary woman in so many ways just a lovely human being first and foremost but also you're right like her history as an art teacher an art educator at the, you know, at the college level, moving to Europe, you know, she was married to Charles White, and you can see in their work together how they influenced each other. And then she met Pancho, married him and had her children, David. She just embodies so much. And not only did I, you know, know her through my, you know, the gallery, I actually uh, lived in Mexico. I went to school at Ohio State University. My sophomore year, I went to Cuernavaca, which is where Elizabeth lives. And I spent a good amount of time going to her house and swimming in her pool. Um, I went to her, into her studio too. One day I was over there and we were just hanging out and she's like, Rhonda, can I take your photographs? And I'm like, Sure. I mean, I look crazy. That was back in the day when natural hair was, has always certainly been cool, but you know, we didn't know as much back then about how to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know what chlorine does to our hair? I was just swimming away and she was taking photographs of me and I didn't realize until probably in the early 2000s for another show that she was having with my mom. And she had done one of the most extraordinary drawings of me from one of those pictures that she took. And I, I actually now own it. No way. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. Yeah, it's gorgeous too. I have a couple of really great friends who are in this business and, and buy and sell African-American art. He knows this genre extremely well. And he said, this is one of the best drawings I've seen of her work. Mm. And it's a picture of me, right? It's crazy. That's amazing. <laughs> what an incredible story and an incredible way to grow up. Did you always think that you were going to be an artist as a child? My dad, Malcolm Brown, taught at the Cleveland Institute of Art. He's collected in the um, Cleveland Museum of Art. He also taught at Shaker Heights High School. And so every night after dinner, my dad had this practice to, of painting. While he was painting, I was sitting right next to him. And so at a very young age, like I would always be with my dad following his lead. I went to art classes at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I was always interested. I was always like, and I started when I was five years old. I would always get really good feedback. And it's probably just because I was sitting there watching my dad constantly painting. And he would kind of create these, like, I, I mean, I was just, I would be marveled how, you know, watercolor is really difficult, right? Because basically you're painting backwards, right? Because you're using the white of the paper as your highlights. So traditional painters, they, they put the, the, the light in after. Well, as a watercolorist, you have to remember or think really hard about how you want to use the structure of your paper. Because the structure, that, that white of your paper, is the highlight in your painting, if that makes sense. Watching him do that helped shape me as the artist that I am absolutely had been impacted by all the things I've seen from not only my dad and the artists that I spent time with and having, you know, my parents have an incredible collection of art. So just seeing that, seeing it, you know, being immersed in it definitely has had an impact. Then beyond that is I went to Ohio State to be an artist. I got my BFA in painting and drawing from OSU. Uh, but I also got a double major in art history because I just literally fell in love with 
the idea of spending time looking at other art and artist artistic traditions and understanding the um, historical, social, uh, emotional, and all the context around the creation of the work that was created. And then I decided to get my master's degree in art history. I then kind of immersed myself deeper into artwork and, and artist movements. That's really what has shaped me. All of those experiences together have created the work and has influenced the work that I create. I certainly am totally inspired by African artists and African artist movements. And then clearly how the 19th and 20th century painters use that as a point of departure in their work. Certainly those influences are things that drive me as an artist. You know, I don't even know how to quantify that because when I see a mask, right, then when I see how that ma that distortion of a face or an image has been translated into a painting, you know, whether it's Picasso or Matisse, a number of artists, for example, even Elizabeth Catlett, who kind of created these works with these oversized hands and these kind of very large eyes or Diego Rivera who kind of did the same thing, who kind of created expressive figures and shapes and little huge hands and, and feet. You know, to, to talk about how a African object influences you, it's very difficult, but it's just really what you see. And then how you as an artist decide to, to kind of create a larger image based on what you remember and how that impacted you. I don't know why I make those choices, but I do. I think it's very difficult to quantify how what you've seen impacts you, but you just know it does. So I hope that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I remember reading an interview or hearing someone talk about Elizabeth Catlett. And one of the things that she says a lot is how important the common person is in her work. I think in doing a bit of research on you, I think I remember reading somewhere where you said where you're really interested in, in the everyday person. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I feel like there's just a lot of beauty in kind of the ordinary. I just sat down and I really tried to paint Kamala Harris and she's just so beautiful. Like it was just really difficult for me to like create this painting that actually looked like her. Right. And actually the painting is it's a little ominous right and it's got this kind of really like expressive fierce look which is how i describe her or how i think of her but beauty is for me found in just everyday objects and and regular things as opposed to you know really opulent things i'm drawn to people that have you know sitting you know in these very like you know stately ways but you can just see that their experience through their posture. And that's what I try to articulate in my work, which is this you know, idea that everyday people not only deserve, but should be honored, right? Because they're the people who are really doing the work. I was struck by like looking at old photographs of like my great grandmother and my great aunts. They're just big like arms and legs and and but they're just smiling and just happy that is just such the opposite of what is portrayed in our culture so i just really like to honor the beauty in in the ordinary and the hard work and the strength of women and men that have bared the brunt of society I'm really driven by that and I'm really attracted to creating, you know, and, and seeing that on people's walls, right? Because those people should be honored and revered. They're the people who make our society work. You don't see um, often people lauding garbage, uh, people who pick up, you know, rubbish and garbage or people who clean buildings, but those are, are the people who keep everything going well or even i was thinking during covid how lucky we are that we have access to clean water have water and it's some of the especially since i grew up in haiti and knowing about if you want to and i grew up i should say 
where we didn't have running water in our home. And so you would have to go to a well to get the water. And if you had to take a bath, you had to have the foresight to leave it out in the sun so it could warm up because otherwise coming from the well, it's really cold. And I think some of those things always make me really happy that I, I have what I have. And it makes me realize too that the common people, and, and I say that in quotes, they're the ones who really keep our society running and they don't always get the credit at all for doing the work. And for- beyond that, Martine, they're just so beautiful, right? There's just, there's so much beauty in the shapes of their faces and the ways in which they still shine and rise, right? And it's just so beautiful to me. I have to agree with you. And I remember loving the work of Roy de Carava because, you know, he, that's one of the things he did brilliantly as a photographer in terms of uh, taking photographs of hands and taking photographs of a worker going up the stairs at the end of a shift. It is, it's just really beautiful. I'd love to talk about what you do when a piece isn't really working for you. So you were talking about the Kamala Harris piece that you're trying to do and it's not quite coming together. Mm-hmm. And so how do you, what do you do in that case? First, you kind of just work and rework it. In my studio or wherever I'm painting, I actually take a photograph of the stages of the painting because even though I'm looking at it, I need to see it with different eyes and you can see it through another lens when you when you take a photograph of it and you actually look at it again. And I just kept reworking and I, I continue to go in the painting. Sometimes I abandon it, right? All together. You know, this one I finished. I do really like the piece. Um, I also did one of Stacey Abrams, which I actually love. I wish I could show you that painting of Stacey because she's beaming. She's glowing. I've heard so many people who feel that she's such an amazing, you know, wonderful, you know, hopeful politician also said, you know, things like, well, she, she needs to to drop a few pounds. And I'm like, what? You know, like I really have both experienced that kind of shaming myself as a professional. And I wanted to kind of give her this space of royalty, right? I mean, she's such a beautiful woman. She's got so many interesting planes and shapes in her face. Her hair is sumptuous and gorgeous. I just wanted to kind of honor her. And back to Senator Harris, you know, she is beautiful and I don't at all want to discount beauty, right? I persevered and I would say that the painting of Stacey Abrams is just gorgeous and kind of projects this light. The painting of Senator Harris projects this fierceness. I'm really pleased with both. They're just different. And so when you ask, like, how do I move as an artist when I'm creating something and it's not going the way I I like, I either abandon it, keep going into it. I also have some artist friends that I work with and I send them pictures. I'm like, what do you think? Like, where can I go with this? Because, you know, part of being an artist is, is having a community too of people that know you and know your work well enough to tell you when to stop and are willing to help say, "Ah, that one's not right. That one's not quite right. You need to kind of push that a little bit further. Or there's something not yet resolved about the left side of X, Y, and Z. That's really how I work through challenges with my paintings. I like the part where you say that you have to take a photo of the work and to to be able to see it in a different light. I do feel sometimes I have to do that as well. I'll print out a piece I'm working on just to make sure that the color treatment is right. In talking about color too, can we talk about the colors that you've chosen? Because I think your color palette is very specific to you. How did you come to that decision of, of, or did you even come to that decision? Was it something that was natural? So color is something that I really uh, feel like I have quite a bit of expertise in. And I remember making my color palettes in my freshman year of art school. And I remember doing it in my art program in high school, learning about tints and shades of color and using them next, buttressing them up against each other and or using them to create moods is something that I am really invested in. Early on in my artistic career, which I still feel my artistic career is fairly young, but kind of when I was in school and right after, I had this very bright palette. Then I started to challenge myself 
with this muted palette uh, because I think it's harder, right? It's, it's, it's more difficult to take tints and shades of color and use them in ways that create harmony. I really challenge myself and sometimes I'll just like grab colors from my studio and I'll put them on my palette and then that's what I have to use to create the painting. Just because for me, it's like a challenge. And then kind of incorporating, you know, gray, black, and white to push, pull the hues back and forward. For me, it's like fun. It's like a game for me. You know, I know when it's finished, just based on how the color is feeling. Honestly, that's really when I know that painting has come together, that the, the palette of the colors feel connected and grounded. That's how I know my painting's done. And when you know that it's done, is it just a feeling that comes over you? Or is it that it's your eye has been attuned to doing it in a specific way for so long that you just know? I think it's that my eye feels good. It's just something I know. It's like you can see it. When you know that something tastes delicious, like it's come together in the right way, it's there. And you know when something is still not quite right, you've got to fix it, then you fix it. Have you ever had a case where it felt wrong, but you, you let it go anyway? Or have you always when it have um, worked until it's felt right? Well, the reason why I'm asking this question is you grew up with seeing what good art looks like. <laughs> and I'm wondering if being around good art must have heightened your, your sensibility in one way or another so that you would know when a piece is done and when it feels right. Yeah, I mean, certainly, <laughs> I, I think about Blue Ivy all the time, right? And how those children are being raised by, like, unbelievable, like, visionaries in music. And just, like, through osmosis, what they're gaining is just, like, wow, right? And so I, I don't know quite if that's the, the right parallel for me, but certainly having the experiences I've had and at such a young age, both in my house and then seeing so much of it has definitely impacted what I am able to produce, like how I see a line and how I like, oh, that's really beautiful, right? And to answer your question, like, have I sold something that I don't necessarily love? Certainly, right? But honestly, when I see it again, I'm like, oh, that is kind of beautiful, right? You know what I mean? So I typically don't allow something that I really disdain go out into mm -hmm. the public. I don't. That makes sense. Uh, because, yeah, because that represents me, right? And if I have, by, you know, by chance, like, you know, it's kind of like you see it and you're just like, oh, I hate that. I've taken paintings off the wall and gone back into them and found a way to make it work for me. People love, you know, artwork and they love to look at it and they love to have it on their walls. And I, I am such a proponent of that, but I also am a huge proponent of like really beautiful work. And also the notion that there is a wide range of art that is beautiful and it's not just the artist or the art movement that, you know, has historical context or academic prowess and education. There's so much beautiful work out there. I'm very attuned to that, that idea that, you know, there's, there's really great work and you didn't have to be schooled to create great work, right? You can, you can do it and ascend and become someone really special without all that pedigree. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Can you tell me what some of your sources of inspiration are when you're ready to, to create? Where, where do you look? I have Henri Matisse's retrospective book in my studio. And for some reason, that is my like main source of material. I love to page through that book. It just inspires me every time I look at it. I also have uh, Virgil Abloh's first exhibition book in my studio. He, he had it at the MCA. I heard him speak. I'm so moved by his sense and sensibility from being a graffiti artist to moving into this really high art form. Like he's, he's at the top of the fashion art game, right? And so I'm, I'm just inspired by 
his work and his story, I love most about him is like the idea of what he sees or what he has seen and then how he's been able to translate that into his work is really interesting to me. And all the people that, you know, the graffiti artists that he grew up around, I mean, he's clearly much younger than many of them, but like the fact that he's kind of pulled them back into the conversation, understanding his roots is just really cool to me. I often look at Elizabeth Catlett's work because she's one of the best, Charles White. I look a lot at his work. You know, Gustave Courbet is someone who I absolutely adore. I love German expressionists work. I love Emil Nold. There's just so many people that I look at the simplicity of the brushstroke. I'm totally moved by. Amy Sherald, I'm totally inspired by her. I don't know. She's kind of like this photographer that creates these paintings that are just like super vibrant and like I'm just like in awe of how the kind of flatness of what she's able to do but then there's just like this all this depth in her work I just love it have Um, you ever reached out to her I haven't I have not you should I would love to talk to her for so many reasons but yeah because it's kind of like artists on artists you know her work and her story is so amazing she had um an interview debbie millman's design matters a few years ago i'll try to find it to send it to you and it was really interesting just to hear her story and how she decided to paint the way she now paints yeah i'd love to hear it i would love to hear it yeah and then Um, theaster gates is someone else i just love his work who is that i don't i didn't remember i didn't hear Uh, Theaster Gates. Um, oh, how do you spell that? Um, T-H-E-A-S-T-E-R, Gates. He's here in Chicago, which is, you know, I- I'm a native Clevelander, but I- I've been living in Chicago since 1995. I met Theaster when we were working around at one of these art- an arts education organization called Marwin, and he was doing these incredible uh, ceramic pieces. I was so drawn to his work because it was almost like these pots like were growing from the ground then how he was able to kind of translate his vision from you know these 3d pieces into like i mean he is almost he's an architect i mean he creates these like spaces really beautiful totally ultra modern paintings that are you know mostly found created from found objects you know use kind of keeping in mind this japanese tradition of ceramicists for ceramics that he you know kind of started from i just am so inspired by even that idea of being able to kind of like create something from nothing that looks like this thing from the ground and then kind of turning it into this like three-dimensional experience that incorporates sound and music and even sometimes food i mean he's just he's like the ultimate to me and I love his story too. And again, it, like there's this um, pattern in artists that I'm drawn to. It's just, they like, you know, started doing what they love and then kind of p- pursued um, their passion and t- kind of took it in whatever direction it took, it, it has taken them. So you think that is in terms of you honoring your practice, that's a, a work in progress or is it something that you've always done right from the beginning? I left art school. I started working in arts education. I got married young, young. I was what, I don't know, 28 when I got married. I had my son, Avery, uh, you know, for, for my age, that, that was pretty young, right? To have a baby when you're 28 years old, living in Chicago, married, right? Like all my friends were hanging out and having fun. And I was like being a, a responsible mom. So I stopped creating artwork because I was in a terrible marriage and, you know, that really impacts you. I had to really become the one responsible for my kids. I had to make a decision, you know, as a mom, you know, I had to send my kids to private school and, and make sure that they have everything that they need. Their father just wasn't there for them and still isn't. And so I stopped creating. I remember my last show that I had at my parents' gallery I was pregnant with my 15-year-old. I sold this great painting to Crystal Anthony McGuire, who is a huge collector of art in New York right now. And if that was any indication 
that I should have kept painting, but I stopped for like 10 years. And then in the late kind of mid 2000s, right after I got divorced, I picked it up again. And, you know, I was like, I've got to do this more because I'm good at it. It's almost like you lose yourself and then you find yourself again. People kept encouraging me. My sister-in-law, Amy Barnett, she was like, you need to like get this work out here. You're so good. And so she's like, get it on your Facebook page. You need an Instagram page. You need a website. And she said that to me for years. And I kept on kind of like presenting myself as an artist. I would rent out spaces and I would be the creator and I would be the seller. I would always sell out. You know, that's a lot of work to be a mom, to find time to create your work. And then to like have to sell it, market, all that stuff, it's exhaust. It was exhausting. I kind of just stopped trying to self-present myself and I was staying in my lane and I was like kind of doing commissions for friends. And, you know, this, I did this one piece of Shirley Chisholm and my friend Ramsey was like, you know what, this, your work is so beautiful and you're so good. I'm going to help you. And she made my website for free. That website that you'd see, rkbfineart.com, she helped me create it. And it was just like one thing after the other. I got my website. I started my Instagram page. People started noticing me. People were like, you're an artist? Like I had no idea, Rhonda. If you don't know me that well, you don't know that I'm an artist. But people who know me really well know that I went to art school and I have this like totally, you know, crazy background, right? (laughs) With my parents. Then I ended up going to Spelman Morehouse Homecoming. A friend of mine said, we're doing this thing on the vineyard. I'm like, oh, I'm going. I'd love to have my art on the vineyard. And she's like, well, let's talk about this. Ended up showing my work to the woman who's having this event on the vineyard. She chose me as the artist of the soul of Sonoma on the vineyard. And she said, well, let me introduce you to this gallery dealer who just opened up, Val Francis. She has this new gallery in this old space called Dragon. Dragonfly Art Gallery, which is a very well-known. Oh, like, I know gallery. Dragonfly. Yeah. So her gallery is in Dragonfly. So she bought that space and she changed the gallery name to Nowhere Art. And she said, Rhonda, I love your work. Let's do it. And she loved my story too, right? Like with my family background. So I've had two summers out on that vineyard with my work and I've had tremendous success. It's been great. So that's kind of how I've evolved That's my story. Marriage, bad marriage, divorce, taking care of my kids. I've had some health issues that I had to deal with. I still persevered through all of it. And now I feel like I've found my place. While I still have a full-time job, because I have to, because I have to take care of my children, I'm an artist. I want to die an artist, Mm. you know what I mean? As an artist, I, I want to be known as an artist. I owe being able to say that to my father, who has incredible recognition you know he's collected in the cleveland museum of art but he's definitely a regional artist and he's so good Uh, my parents did so much right to like catapult african-american art into the space it is in and i feel like i want to honor that and you know honor my practice and get better and better and better and and you know be shown across the country and in other countries and i would love to be museum collected one day I know you will. (laughs) So it sounds like all of that um, in terms of you being represented is, and the work that your parents have done is what brought you to create Critique House. So you created Critique House with your son, Avery. And so the goal is to help BIPOC artists to continue to thrive as they pursue their creative practice. And you're also creating a curated e-gallery to sell limited editions of their work. Did you have a Critique House in mind for a very long time before you launched it? I'm so glad that you're like drawing all this out of me, Martine, because all of these things that have happened to me have this kind of progression and story. So I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and I have, you know, a group of women that in my life that are, you know, really encouraging me to live into my greatness, right? I hired this business consultant and I went to see her to talk about my art business, right? Told her the story that I just told you, like, you know, I've got this art business and I'm doing all these great things. And, you know, like, you know, here's my thing. Like, I'm a fine artist and I want to like take this fine artist, my fine art and kind of push it to, you know, where I'm, where I can go. But I said, also, 
well, I've got these like really great. And I pulled out like the proofs of my prints. And I said, you know, I've got this really great idea that I, I really think has some legs. Like over the last year and a half, I've been selling my art as prints online and people are buying it. And I've got, you know, a certain price point. And I said, I have this idea, like, you know, so many artists have great work kind of sitting in their, their studios that really they're doing nothing. That's like picking up dust. Wouldn't it be great if there was like the space that was, that lived online that like allowed artists by black you know, indigenous people of color, artists from all over the globe, send me really high, you know, definition images of their work. And then I would create this marketing engine and these audiences for their artwork. She was like, oh my God, that's such a great idea. And I'm like, yeah. And it needs to be accessible because everybody should be able to have great artwork on their walls. These are entry level pieces. It's original work that's been reproduced. And, you know, I've got an amazing printer here in the Chicago metropolitan area that I'm working with. But, you know, my parents used to sell these lithographs of my dad's work or serigraphs of my dad's work. And, you know, the deeper you got into the edition, the worse the quality of the print got. But now with the digital images, you know, like digital cameras, you can like see brush strokes in some of these prints. It's amazing. I went on this journey to like discover how I could create this space. And I called it Critique House because ultimately, like phase one of Critique House is helping artists generate income so that they can continue to pursue their passion. So many artists stop creating because they can't make money doing it. You know, the idea is volume. Let's get as many of these prints out here at $150 each. The artist gets 60% of it. I take 40% of it uh, because of the, for the marketing and all the, you know, backend infrastructure to, you know, have this e-gallery. They're generating money based on volume of the prints that are going out the door. Vision for it. And then phase two is to then create this kind of space where an artist, it's an artist's community where artists can do several things. Number one, they can take online courses or get content so that they can figure out how to like varnish and finish their paintings, right? Or how to integrate multimedia into their work or learning new media, new technology. Like there's always something changing in the art world. And, you know, all of us who went to art school, you have that for four years and then you're done. And you're basically like learning to do stuff like by failure, right? Like, well, that didn't work. So let me try this way. You know, that's what art school teaches you. It teaches you how to fail, right? And then you figure out how to create, you know, you you create, you figure out how to solve problems using your creative genius to do X, Y, and Z. But you only get four years of that if you go to college. And if you don't, you know, have, you know, four years of it at all, you're really learning by yourself. And think about how many artists that are actually out there creating that didn't have the opportunity to go to college for whatever reason, their parents were like, no, you're not going to make any money or this is not a viable you know, option for you. You know, I want to kind of create this community where we, you can hone your technique. You can also have the opportunity to have online critiques with other artists because that's another thing that is so essential and critical to building your skills as an artist. You need to have a community of people who can look at your work and say, yes, no, push here. Tell us about your work, right? Yeah, that's like what you just said when you're having difficulty with the work. You reach out to your network to be able to get feedback. Exactly. Sometimes you're unable to see what you're doing. Right. And so Critique House will be this virtual space where artists can thrive. And it is my goal to build partnerships with you know, massive brands like Dick Blick or Utrecht or other artist brands that want to get their materials out to other artists. I want to kind of work uh, with a studio to help me build content. Um, And I want it to be real artists that are providing that or, you know, digitally creating that content so that it's uploadable. And then the second phase is member would be is membership based, and you know based on your membership you have access to uh, certain levels of content. Um, of course, all very affordable because 
ultimately, you know, my goal is, you know, everybody eats, right? No more starving artists. Really, that's literally one of my taglines. I'm building out my social media content. Everybody eats, no more starving artists. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I can't wait to see more and to see more artists on the site. At this point, I'd love to ask you a few rapid fire questions just to kind of close us out a bit. Okay. Okay. So coffee or tea? Tea. Your favorite music to listen to while you're working? Gospel. Gospel. Oh, gosh, that must be so nice. Yeah. Your next investment art piece. I want another Bobby Rogers. Oh, yes. His work is brilliant. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, So that's it for now. I always like to ask, do you have any books that you would recommend? You know, I just finished uh, Talking to Strangers by um, Malcolm Gladwell. I loved that book. I thought it was so interesting. In fact, all of his books are super interesting because he just... I love people that help, that really cause you to think. And then lastly, how can we stay in touch with you? My website is www.rkbfineart.com. Um, Critique House is building its social media presence as well as um, the website is active. Um, and we have officially launched that website is www.critique.com. Um, and the critique house is our social media handle on Instagram and, uh, RKB fine art is my Instagram handle for my art, uh, my fine art work. If our listeners wanted to purchase a few pieces from you, they can purchase it directly from your website. As I noticed currently my representation is Val Francis at nowhere art gallery. So she is my Martha's vineyard, you know, representation. But, you know, you can also reach me on my website because Val is my kind of East Coast representation. Do you have any last minute thoughts or anything you wanted to include that you've forgotten? The one thing that's really important for me to kind of translate to anyone who's thinking about being an artist or anyone who's thinking about collecting art for collectors is just to buy what you love, right? Like when you see a piece of work that you're moved by like physically and emotionally moved by, you should buy it if, you know, you can afford it. If you can't afford it, continue to find the work that you love, that you're moved by of somebody that you can, you know, afford that's in your um, kind of within your access, within your reach. Um, And then I think for artists, um, you know, I am continuing to encourage people like me who have, um, have the background or the interest or the academic preparation um, for it. And if life has happened, um, you know, don't give it up. Don't give up your dream to be an artist because, you know, I could have very easily stayed married, kind of just kept working as a fundraiser and, you know, just denied my God-given talent as an artist. And I'm encouraging everybody who is passionate about it, whether you're trained or not, whether you went to college for it or not, to really pursue it because it's just such a good time for artists of color to really kind of enter into this market. And it's also an interesting time to challenge, you know, traditional art dealers on all all the notions of the space that they've created for the art world and the art market to expand upon it. I just really am encouraging people to like double down on your interests as opposed to like letting it go. It reminds me of the poem by Langston Hughes, uh, Dream Deferred. Do you remember it? We yeah. to memorize it. And um, in the sixth grade, we had Sister Josepha. I went to Catholic school who had us memorize a whole host of poems. I've memorized this. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? And I always think of that. And I think that's one of the reasons why I did decide to become a photographer because for 
many years, I had a different job. It's not that I couldn't do it anyway, but I had to slowly ease my way into learning the craft and then transitioning to being a full-time. I was a raisin in the sun. I felt like I was just shriveling up because I wasn't paying attention to it, to the art. Yeah, you have to honor, you have to honor what's gnawing at you. You have to honor that because so much good comes from it, right? So much good has come from me investing my time and my energy into my artwork. And, you know, all of the things that I thought I deserved or should have as, as a professional has come to me as an artist. And, you know, someone today on the phone asked me, well, don't you want to be a full-time artist? And I'm like, I can't afford that. (laughs) But I guess the real question for me is ultimately, can I afford not to do it? Well, that is a perfect place to end. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us, Rhonda. I've really loved talking to you and I've learned so much during our conversation. I can't wait for everyone else to listen and to be connected with you and with your work and with Critique House as well. Yeah, me too. I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Martine. This has been great.